but can't bring nobody for smoking. Yo, bullets flying, mothers crying, brothers dying, lying in the streets. That's why we're trying to stop it from falling apart and going to waste and keeping the smile on the Thank you again for attending tonight. Uh, my name is George Villanueva. I'm a postdoctoral scholar here at the USC Edinburgh School for Communication and Journalism. So tonight is uh, part two uh, of a series of USC Vision and Voices events that are really, that's really exploring the positive community change that the people, organizations, and folks are doing out there in South LA. So um, did anybody come to part one in October? All right, cool. Okay, great. So we have a lot of new folks. So, and just as a general reminder, there's also going to be a walking tour of Lemert Park on March 7th, led by our very own panelists today, Karen Mack of LA Commons. So if you're interested in that, there's a, check out the website, USC's Vision and Voices website to register as well. So um, I first want to, of course, thank uh, Vision and Voices for being our main sponsor tonight, and also the Black Social Work Caucus and also the Environmental Student Assembly for being our co-sponsors. I also want to acknowledge uh, Allison Trope and Taj Fraser, professors, here for being uh, co-organizers for tonight's events. And also thank again um, uh, the Annenberg Facilities Team, the Public Affairs Team, and also Intersection South LA for being partners tonight. So one other thing, um, tonight after the event, uh, we're gonna have a reception. It's up on the second floor patio. Um, local food from Community Services Unlimited will be up there. And also you can, um, we have James Rojas, who's the founder and creator of Place It, and he's gonna lead you through a very fun and engaging um, activity uh, that's uh, building um, a part of South LA, Florence and Normandy. So anyone know the historical significance of Florence and Normandy? Yeah, yeah, someone said, so yeah, the 1992 civil unrest is tied to that corner as well. So, so he's gonna kind of lead you through an exercise, kind of reimagining that area of South LA. Um, and again, uh, we, want, we really encourage you to participate, whether it's offline or online. So if you feel like live tweeting, live Instagramming, please, with your thoughts, whether it's during the panel or after the event, use the hashtag MySouthLA and We'll, we'll gladly kind of also want to check that while you're doing that. Um, also, we passed out, and uh, while you were coming in, two different things to encourage participation as well. One is a My South LA map, where you can map uh, uh, your kind of personal kind of uh, meaning about South LA, whether it's somewhere where you live, where you eat, where you hang out. So we encourage you to kind of draw to your heart's desires as well. And just an example from, the last fall event, uh, someone drew um, uh, on their MySouth LA map places where they live and, and places where they hang out as well and also drew different things as well. Um, a second thing that we passed out is uh, MySouth LA is placards. So here we just wanna uh, get your kind of feelings about how you feel your personal South LA is. So we also gave you Sharpie, so feel free to again mark this up as well. And just two examples again from last fall's event. Uh, My South LA is makeover, but don't take over. And a second one, um, My South LA is evolving in a dynamic way. So whatever your feelings are, go ahead and list them. At the end of the event and um, even at the reception, we'll be collecting them and we'll actually aggregate all of them and actually have them up on our Intersection South LA website where you can take a look at everybody's contribution and also get a recap of tonight's event and also last fall's event as well. So um, just before we, uh, we start the panel, I actually want to talk a little bit about just the South LA geography. Uh, there's no definite boundaries of the geography. A lot of people have different perceptions about South LA and its geography. So it, it, it goes beyond that, the typical South Central area that surrounds uh, USC and other people's perceptions kind of have it going all the way down to Watts and even other uh, LA County cities such as Compton and Gardena and also Inglewood and so forth out in the West. So there, uh, that's kind of some of the things we'll be talking about, but also talking about a lot of the great community work that's actually going on in the area as well. But also trying to also get beyond any us versus them kind of dichotomies such as USC versus the community or one neighborhood versus another neighborhood. So a lot of the work that your panelists here today do are really kind of that work to kind of bridge those kind of different spaces. Um, so one thing um, 
a lot of the social justice work in uh, South LA, a lot of it is paid attention to the economic and political uh, organizations that are doing a lot of that work. But tonight we really wanted to highlight how food, arts, and recreation contribute to that, the social justice challenges in South LA. So tonight you'll be hearing about from a lot of the leaders in that, in that work. So for example, Karen Mack of LA Commons, who does a lot of great work um, uh, kind of holding community-based art workshops and neighborhood tours that really uh, expose all Angelinos to a lot of cultural gems in South LA. Um, you'll also be hearing from uh, Ben Caldwell of um, the Chaos Network, and he collaborates a lot with local artists, local musicians, to really provide local storytelling in South LA. He also, as you can see, he also repurposes payphones, working with our own Annenberg professor, Francois Barr, on how they can actually be local history, uh, multimedia kind of outlets in the, in the community as well. Um, we also have Neelam Sharma here, uh, who is from Community Service Unlimited. She does a lot of great food justice work and food access work that really provides local access to local food in the area and actually also uh, builds on urban agriculture in the area, so providing ways to really grow your food locally in South LA. And uh, lastly, we have JP Pardita, who is, uh, through his very innovative mobility work, he works with a lot of local youth through his Los Riders uh, a Bicycle Club to involve them in different types of biking activities that, uh, that expose them to safe activity and also different ways to exploring the neighborhood as well. So um, as an introduction, those are the four, and actually I, I want to actually get into that right now. So um, I'm gonna actually start with Neelam, and actually starting on this point of uh, why um, arts, uh, recreation, and food matters for social justice. How, how would you say food has mattered for the social justice work that you bring about in South LA? Um, well, I mean, to start with the obvious, food is life. We all need to eat. Um, and as such, food is uh, one of the best connectors that there is, not just to us as each other as human beings, and therefore food is community, but um, it's also food, you know, is an entry point into almost any social issue you can think of. Um, rights to land, rights to water, um, the way that um, our political system is organized, um, the way that things are distributed, you know, uh, food, food really gets to the heart of the matter in almost anything because um, in order to grow food, you have to have access to land, you have to be able to use water, you have to have systems of distribution set up, you know, and we've seen in situations where um, people don't have control of those things that they don't actually have control over their own lives. So therefore, food um, is central to just about anything you can think of and you can actually make it part of any kind of campaign around anything. So, um, and I think especially at this time, you know, um, and, and tell me when you want yeah. me to wrap uh, maybe, up. And also you maybe know. you could point, I don't know how many people have been to your expo farm that's close by. Yeah, so. sure. Um, you know, so, so for us in South LA, you know, because this, this is obviously a really broad issue, but in South LA, food um, is crucial because historically in South LA, um, we've been very underserved for food. So, you know, I moved to Los Angeles about 18 years ago, and I moved to South LA. It was my first experience of America. I moved right to South LA with a baby and a very young child who's about 10. And, and so for me, it was immediate. Like, how can I get food to feed my family? So, and there really wasn't, you know, really like outlets for buying good food in LA that wasn't extremely expensive. And even for that, you had to actually leave the neighborhood. And to be honest, not a lot has changed. I mean, we've had three Ralphs in and around South LA, in the area of South LA I live in alone, closed in the last, what, year and a half? Um, and all the surveys and studies that, you know, universities and other folks have done show that the net sort of increase or decrease of, of um, you know, uh, uh, stores that sell fresh food for areas like South LA have decreased since the rebellion. You mentioned that, that date earlier, um, despite all the work that's been done around it. So, and really for, for someone like me, whose history is in really kind of doing for ourselves and social justice and kind of organizing our own stuff, 
it really came down to, because when I first started doing this work, it was like, okay, well, how can we bring in, you know, a Trader Joe's or, or other people who could bring in affordable food that was good quality? And they're not interested, right? That's what we found. So ultimately, it's like, really, how do you really take ownership? And really, it's about how can you do that yourselves? And in the process of doing that, so what we've been doing is building urban farms locally in South LA, and I invite any of you to come out on a Tuesday between 9 and 12 to the Expo Farm and check it out for yourself, or on a Saturday or to any of our other farms that we've created in, in the community. But um, it's, it's beyond just growing, you know, a little bit of food in the city. It's about making those relationships. It's about using food to really um, engage people once more about where their food comes from. So it's that little bit of experience of coming on the farm and maybe planting a seed and seeing that emerge into a plant that you can actually eat, which actually the magic of that never goes away. And I'll tell you that it's, trans it's a transformative experience. And however old I get, every time I put a seed in the ground, I'm always like, oh my God, it came up, you know? Um, but it's about more than that. It's about what that connects to. It's about all the infrastructures that you have to build to really build a, a food system. And in the process of doing that, who you do that with. So for us, it's about preferencing young people in our community to learn those skills, to actually facilitate the sharing of those skills, because many times those skills are there, you know, and it's about spreading them. And then building, a, building an infrastructure to... Um, to distribute that food. And that's what we're in the process of doing with our village marketplace, social enterprise, um, and all the other stuff we do around that. Great. Cool. And, and just as a second kind of segue, I mean, that brings us to kind of arts. So I kind of, I know Karen and Ben, you both work in arts. So I kind of want to ask you guys how you feel arts contributes to social justice in South LA. Karen, go ahead. <laughs> Ladies first. <laughs> you see how smooth he was? <laughs> Ben is smooth. Right? Uh, um, so I run an organization called LA Commons that I actually started. Um, uh, we did our first programming around 2003. But when I was planning it, I was really thinking about how disconnected Los Angeles felt. Um, you know, and it still feels that way in some ways. You know, p people live in their own little segregated communities, and um, you know, it's hard for people to get out of that box. I mean, the other thing that was very um, present for me was that we had a narrative that wasn't inclusive. So most people, when they talked about Los Angeles, they talked about Hollywood, the beach, uh, Beverly Hills, and you know, nobody I knew was really connected to that. Well, you know, we all love going to the beach, but you know, it's like such a small portion of Los Angeles, and you know, there's so many great places, and that was the thing. You know, you had all of this culture. I used to. And I still talk about the fact that you could travel anywhere in the world in Los Angeles. One of our projects we ended up doing along 3rd Street was with the Bangladeshi community. When we stumbled on the Bangladeshi community in Los Angeles with like 30,000 people, we were like, there are Bangladeshis in Los Angeles? So, so we have everything here, but you know, amazingly, we were not talking about it. So <clears throat> my question was, how could you leverage all this culture to enfranchise people, because many of those places that were the most culturally rich were also places where people were pretty poor. Um, and, um, you know, in so doing, make the whole city feel more connected. I mean, uh, Neelam's remarks really um, carry over to the arts in terms of being a connector. And I was thinking about this idea of, you know, how is it that you create connections? And so, um, you know, the arts really uh, make that possible. And ultimately, it gets down to people, you know, and I think that that's where um, power comes from in general is that person-to-person -person connection. And if you look at what our work is really about, that's at the heart of it. And when we started, um, the, what we did was we found artists. And um, there are researchers actually at USC that really talk about this powerful role of artist as, um, and, and Ben is like, when he talks, you'll see, he's like the perfect, I'm not an artist, everybody thinks I'm an artist, but not really. <laughs> Can you guess what my undergraduate degree is in? Anybody? Literature. One more guess? Accounting. <laughs> 
So I'm not really, and I have an MBA on top of it. So, so I'm not really an artist, although maybe you might think of me as a creative, but Ben is an artist and I watch him in awe as he um, you know, creates these connections ben, between people. And so that's what we're trying to get to. And so we engage artists. Our very first project was in MacArthur Park you know, when I was growing up, like the the uh, fake ID capital of the world, um, and um, still that way to some extent when we started working there, and we just engage the artist, and then they engage young people. Again, another alignment in our work to um, to connect with the broader community to pull out the stories, the rich stories. I mean, every community is so wonderful if you start digging into what's there in terms of the narratives and the culture. And, you know, I just love my job, if you can't tell. Um, and so we put these teams together and they take those stories and transform them into public art. And so um, that's been a very rewarding process, both in terms of empowerment of the individual, but also empowerment of these communities that finally have their stories in the public realm. Um, and the tours that we do are also about getting those, another way to get those stories out there and to get those person-to-person -person connections made so that we all feel like we're part of one city. I think that's a good segue to... Mm -hmm. Hello, hello. All right. So um, the best way to explain my use of art is I think of, of it as really a holistic all of the things are together. Uh, that's how I was taught initially when, I'm from New Mexico, so one of the ways that my first teacher taught us how to deal with art was also the chemistry of the paints, to really look at that, to look at the chemistry of, of throwing clay and then putting the glaze on it, all the chemistry that makes that happen. So, uh, and I used to do leather and the whole process of reprocessing leather and making those into events and ideas. So um, that's my, my early life. So within, um, within that, I ended up being a filmmaker. I studied uh, film school, but even within that, it was the whole idea of how could we also engage kids and people with the tools that we were that we had at the elitist place that I went to school which was UCLA <laughs> with the bear there the opposite of you guys but you know we did we had fun there um, I was a part of the group of guys that was called the LA rebellion and a lot of what we ended up doing was dealt with really a progressive forward use of, of the medium that tried to deal with it in, a, in an African-esque way, where, where it was very holistic, very uh, not art for art's sake, but art for a reason. Um, so um, my first use with kids was I came here in 1984 after teaching at Howard for three years. I really got turned out by teaching kids. It really uh, engaged me. So I wrote an artisan community grant to engage the youth in South Central. And I was at that time a resident at Watts Towers. Um, and I set up my other portion of my facility at where I am now at, at Chaos Network. Which, by the way, I, we called it Chaos Network because the name means where brilliant dreams were born in the ancient context of chaos. You know, it's, uh, so we thought we would have a tongue-in-cheek way of dealing with our community. So if you come there expecting to see black folks in chaos, then you saw that. <laughs> but if you understood the higher sense of where we are as a culture and where we are as people, that you'd also get that. So the other thing that that's interesting for me is that I don't really see a difference between any of these arts and science and business. I think that's a categorization that, uh, that doesn't need to be because you need creative juices to, to be an accountant. <laughs> you know, you need creative juices to, in order to be, uh, to work in the fill, uh, and I've done that. Uh, one portion of what we have is a, um, um, we have a thing called the Seeds of Carver, uh, 
as a part of a engagement uh, for the community on learning how to grow because it was uh, a project that grew in my black backyard on trying to figure out how artists could engage the, the ground and make things grow from it because I was raised as a farmer as a kid and so I really respect the whole idea of of how transcendental that is, you know, and uh, and uh, that's I would go into that same mindset as I do when I'm creating a film or when I'm writing uh, my ideas, and so I I really there's a kind of a a marriage between the plants and the earth and and humans that are really 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 important. So that's something else that we did uh, presently. Uh, we're working in my front yard in Lamert Park. And we've appropriated the street uh, for the use of the people and calling it the People's Street. And Francois and all of us are going to make that an innovation village uh, or a plaza where we can drop in our repurposed ideas uh, of how we could uh, look at this new 21st century and look in our neighbor look at our neighborhood in a different way too because a lot of what people think is that um, in South Central you only have the boys in the hood and you have those guys there too but they live in in real beautiful relationship with us too because I've worked with Project Bloat and Project Bloat is hardcore it's serious and very artistically wonderful. So uh, that also, sh we, we tried to deal with a different way to look at even the b-boys. So a lot of what I've tried to do is just to look at everything very, very artistically, but very open in the sense of how it's looked at in a holistic manner. And as a reminder, the walking tour will actually be visiting these places in Lehman Park. So again, uh, feel free to do that. But another types of tour, uh, JP, you do a lot of bicycle tours working with youth and, and so forth in South LA. So maybe if you could kind of talk about how your work kind of affects social justice. All right, let me, uh, my name is JP, Javier Partida. Everybody knows me as uh, JP. Let me tell you a little bit about myself and the bike club. Uh, the bike club started in uh, May of 2012. And the reason I started this cycling movement was because I wanted to give the youth a safe space where they could hang out and really talk about the problems that go on in the neighborhood. Um, the bike club was inspired by another bike club that's in the community uh, known as Eastside Riders. I used to be a member of that club at, I will say like around, I started with them like around September of 2011 and then in May, I started my own thing, and I started recruiting a lot of these a lot of these young kids that would come to the youth center where I work. Um, by taking them out on these rides, they started noticing that there's a lot of negativity that goes on in the community, and they and they started noticing on how they could make a change. I I remember that when I first got the first group, I told them that. If all of us ride in a group together, they're never going to single one person out because the other focus is in just on the big group. So what I did was um, I got everybody matching shirts with our logo, and we went on our first ride, and, uh, and they got a surprise because they never thought that they were going to be able to cruise through these neighborhoods without being banged on. You know, so I mean, now the focus is more on, on on trying to get all these kids out of trouble. We had, this club has had a lot of success. Um, most of the kids that, that, that have been through this program have built up self-esteem and, and confidence in themselves. They have managed to get jobs and, and graduate from high school. I have, I have four girls that got scholarships to good, to good schools. Uh, one is going to UC Merced, another one's going to uh, UC Irvine, another one to Cal State LA, and uh, I think there's going to be one going to Mount St. Mary or something like that down the street. So <clears throat> a lot of these kids have used this program to, to kind of get away from all the problems that they have at home. So, I mean, that's all I could say about that. Right, and you have some, some of your youth here. Oh, yeah, I have my... Uh, William Fabian, he's been in the club for, for three years already. Um, he's my sergeant at arms. And Terry Calderon, she's been in the club also for two and a half years, and she's the treasurer of the club. And, and 
I'll say that if it wasn't because of her support, I don't think that we would be where we at right now. So she, she deserves a lot of the credit too. Great. So, so one other uh, theme that I, I kind of want to talk about too today is um, there's a lot of demographic change taking place in South LA and um, uh, from traditional African-American kind of population to now um, a very uh, Latino dense population. And I know a lot of the work that you guys do are on connections and really kind of building bridges and so forth. So I'm wondering if any of you and any, please jump in, want to talk about some examples of some of that work that you guys have been doing. Um, um, <clears throat> yeah, if you want to go first, go ahead. Yeah, two years ago, uh, when we started uh, getting together with Eastside Riders and doing more rides together, we decided to uh, to start a, a kickball league, which we did two summers ago, and it was very successful. That's that's how we started bridging the gap the the the, the gap between black and brown. Um, a lot of people started coming out uh, to watch the games and and take pictures and notice on the stuff that we do. <coughs> Excuse me. Everybody knows uh, we started in, in uh, kind of like a group. We call it a, an organization, but you know, just, it's just a group. We call ourselves the United Riders of South LA. And we support each other on these rides so they could see that there could be good relationships between black and brown. And, and, and it has kind of calmed down the, the, you know, the negativity in our area. Great. Um, <clears throat> so a few years ago, we were working on a project in Lamert Park. It was a mural uh, project for Ben's place, actually. Um, I'm so sad that murals, it, it just, um, you know, our work th that we do, the public art, is actually temporary, and this one um, was ready to come down just recently. Oh, so we can, re I didn't know we could, okay. Yeah, it's uh, ready to be refurbished. Oh, great, okay. So we'll fig figure that out. But, but besides that, we our um, process is to, we partner with local high schools and other youth serving organizations to um, recruit students to work on the art teams. And um, you know, if you go, Crenshaw High is very close to Lamert Park. And if you go there, you know, you're, in your mind you're thinking, you know, if you grew up like me in South LA that it's gonna be African American kids, but you know, the population is very diverse, just like South LA is very diverse. So we get a v very mixed group of, uh, young people that include both Latinos and African Americans, um, but they all are excited about having the opportunity to make art that tells the story of their neighborhood and to have the experience of working with an artist, developing their leadership skills and, you know, just the ability to connect with the community and give service to community. And so one of the things that they do as part of the project is go around and interview um, people in the neighborhood. So, um, during the process with this mural, they would go around and people were, particularly with the Latino students, the African American merchants were, you know, a little taken aback that they were being approached by these Latino young people. And so it was a, a challenging, I think, but a growth experience for the students. Um, but the mural came out fantastic. I mean, it was really beautiful and really, I think, captured um, some of the key uh, icons of the neighborhood, both African and also, you know, throughout history of of the neighborhood. And um, there was we the we put the mural up um, a, as a backdrop for one of the events. And one of the people who before had you know been a little bit disparaging said, "Make sure you c take care of that mural." You know that was our kids that painted that mural. So you know it's a really um, wonderful story of how you know this process of you know coming in contact with the other ultimately resulted in you know a deepening of understanding. Yes, um, let's see, for, for quite a few years, uh, starting with especially Cal, I taught at CalArts for 15 years, and so while teaching there, my whole project was to enter, I worked for the community partnership, um, and my portion was to really interconnect the communities through um, the new technologies. So we had 10 different sites that we use, uh, site-specific, 
teleconferencing systems in them, Plaza de la Raza, self-help graphics, Watts Towers, uh, Boys and Girl in Santa Clarita, Cal Arts, uh, My Place Was the Hub, uh, Watts Towers, um, and then uh, visual communications. So my idea at that time was to, to use the Native American structure, which was the four directions, is to get all of the families to communicate with each other uh, instead of us isolating into different boxes, is to each of us with this new technology to communicate and uh, express and do art with each other. So uh, I, that's the way that I've kind of always worked with Los Angeles is I like its, uh, I like the expansion of it. Uh, um, one of my teachers is like John Otterbridge, one of my mentors who also deals with the world like that, and, and especially Jack Jackson who ran Inner City Cultural Center. Uh, so that's the way I try to do it, is to really just break down those boundaries. Uh, one of the projects that we did was with the school here. I, I worked with my place uh, and gathered whole groups of kids from South Central and then interconnected them with um, a, a crossroads school in uh, Santa Monica, which is, you know, on one level and then our kids are on their level and it was fun to, to really see um, to break down the ideas of racism, sexism, uh, all the isms. Uh, and and uh, when you're connecting that way, uh, sometimes it sticks out really strongly. The one thing that I remember the most was uh, one of the kids from Crossroads Schools, their parents says, will my child be safe? Uh, and we're teleconferencing between two places. <laughs> And, and I said, yes, it's going to be a cyber drive-by. <laughs> but, but, but for the most part, I think that, um, that that's the fun uh, of the area that I see, is really to force cultures to, to see each other and to work with each other uh, has been my fun in this town so far. Great. Yeah, and uh, for our work, I would say, I mean, if you look at the word agriculture, there's a word in that that's, that's a connection to what we do. Uh, you know, one of the things I didn't talk about about food is that food is history. Like, in, in our food, in our traditions, in our cultures, there is a rich history that all of us have. Um, so the work that we do, there's a very strong focus on cultural food histories. And um, everywhere from the youngest folks we work with, and we work you know, from pe with pre-kinders all the way up to high school, post high school, and seniors, one of the first dialogues, and, and, we, and we work through, how many of you guys have been here at college, you've heard of Paolo Freire and you know, that kind of pedagogy. So that's really the basis of what we do. And I mean, you want to explain that? Paolo Freire, yeah. So it's, a, it's um, you know, Freire was, I mean, I could go on about him forever, but essentially he was a Brazilian educator who, you know, his whole thing was getting away from the banking system of education that most of us are used to, to very participatory education that uses where people are at, there, and, and also um, really preferences the fact that, you know, nobody comes in with an empty head. Everybody has experience and knowledge that they're bringing to the learning process, right? So that's, that's kind of what we use. And, um, and really it's about using that process to facilitate learning is what we do. Because everybody comes to the table with a lot of knowledge when it comes to food. Um, and so, you know, so one of our very first dialogues with people, whether they're, you know, pre-kinders, first graders, and obviously these happen at a different levels, or high school kids is, what's your, you know, is, is food history and, and, and cultural food history. And through that is how we get to the commonalities, right, around, um, because if you, if you trace food, you trace history. I mean, and just while I'm on this, I have to mention, we're here in LA, you know, the first peoples of LA. Does anyone know who were the first peoples of LA? Sorry? The Tongva, who else? The Shumash, right? These, these were the first peoples of, of the land that we're on. And you can trace, you know, you can like, by looking at, by looking at people's histories and looking at what, what we've eaten over the years, you can actually, there's, there's a lot you can learn from that. And so one of the things that we do is we intentionally use food as a way of bringing our black and brown youth um, and having dialogues around um, some of the differences that have, you know, have been in many ways imposed by, um, you know, by 
oppression, by, by um, politics, um, by the way that our communities have been fractured, right? Um, but then also using the food history to, to kind of talk about the commonalities and the things that we, we have in common historically, the ways that, you know, uh, black and brown people have um, worked together. Um, and, and, and that's kind of how we use um, food uh, on that level, you know. So, and actually, I just want to point out there's a number of our youth here. Do you guys want to just stand up real quick because there's so many of you just... just and these are just some of the young people we work with. These folks, you know, they're the ones who, who run our programs and they're the ones who do the cooking demos, who run the youth programs, do the facilitation and all of that kind of stuff. So that's, that's really very much what we're about. It's about um, working with these, these folks and them then working with other folks. That's what we do. Great. Thanks. One um, other issue I want to talk about and um, just that, that actually needs a lot of dialogue is just really the current expansion by USC, both its development plans and expansion into the neighboring uh, neighborhoods and communities. There's been a lot of um, uh, attention being paid to p fears of gentrification, fears of displacement, fears of safety and so forth. And I think um, some of the work that you guys do kind of work on that or, or how does it impact the work that you do or really if you want to even tackle it uh, how maybe food arts and recreation can be positioned to really impact some of those uh, some of those um, uh, kind of tensions that are flaring up right now with this this current um, development and expansion by USC and the neighbors and so forth so anyone can jump in first it's a lot to say on that <laughs> who wants to jump first <laughs> Um, well, I'll, ju I'll jump just to give you a little bit of break because I have a feeling you, you since you're so close to, um, relative to where we are. Um, we actually have had um, the university actually reached out to us to the civic engagement and government relations department reached out to us to work with them to engage the community in a conversation about um, uh, you know, this neighborhood and, and what was special about the neighborhood. Um, so we've done a couple of projects um, with them. And uh, the first one was when the expo line opened and uh, we engaged, um, I think it was a team of 25 young people, some USC faculty members, art faculty members, uh, local artists, um, uh, some USC grad students in a process to create banners for the neighborhood. And it was a really great coming together of the campus and, um, and the community. Uh, one of the things that we do as part of our projects is something called a story summit. And we did um, the one for this project in the Rose Garden. And so it was, it was, um, you know, it's, I think that's a unique opportunity that ha with that project that happened bringing folks from the university together with um, people from Expo Center and beyond who will reside in the neighborhood to talk and share food, share stories, uh, share art, and um, really get to know each other. I think that's one of the challenges is just breaking down the barriers that exist between the community and um, the, you know, sort of the town and gown uh, challenge. Um, and so we're actually working with them again on a project. And, and we did another iteration, which was really about training young people to be advocates. We have something called Our, Neighbor, Our Neighborhood Youth Artists as Civic Leaders, really training them about key issues and then uh, uh, enabling them to make art about those issues and then use that art as an advocacy tool to talk about the things that they care about. And so um, that process is ongoing and, you know, we look forward to um, doing more. I mean, it's a very challenging issue, I have to say. I mean, I don't want to minimize the challenge because, you know, so much of Los Angeles and, and the difficulty for people of all income levels now is the real estate market and, and how difficult it is to find affordable housing. So, so you know, 
how you deal with that issue is it's much larger than our organization um, but you know everything starts with the dialogue and I think bringing people together to really listen to each other and understand what the issues are is an important first step yeah let's see um, presently we're doing the the project uh, with the School of Innovation, and that's been really innovative and different and engaging. Um, it, it's kind of interesting because my first job um, in Los Angeles was as, as a relocation consultant, and one of the places that I helped clear out is, <laughs> and, and not knowing what, I, I used to uh, help apartments um, people find homes uh, while to help uh, USC expand actually. <laughs> Ironic. <laughs> yeah, which was an interesting gig because it was, um, we had the apartment complexes and the thing that I really made sure is that uh, the people whose homes, whose homes I, uh, that we helped move, that all of the places that they got were a million times better than what they had in the first place. So that's something that I, I felt should be should get known. That was part of what I was doing. It's my first gig. <laughs> but um, presently, I think um, it's, it's going to be very ir interesting because I think what each community will have to do is really uh, do something similar to what we've managed to do in Limer Park, is you really have to uh, put your brightest, strongest, focus, clearest people up front. So you can just make sure you can work with the brightest, clearest, focused people at USC, or else. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. And, and just as a reminder, we're actually in a few minutes we're going to open it up to Q and A. So if you um, uh, the two mics, so you can actually line up there in the, um, and in a few minutes. But I also want to just give Neelam and JP an opportunity to answer that question because they do a lot of stuff as well and know the challenges of actually this. USC and, and neighboring community kind of tension? Yeah, I mean, it's a huge challenge. You know, I'll, I'll say this, and there's, there's so many stories that I could tell, and, and I, you know, there's, there's little time, but just, just in, in terms of even, you know, our, our, our community and the folks who, who, who are part of our work, walking around the neighborhood, the number, I mean, there was an occasion, when was that, like last year during, one of the FGU crews, the From the Ground Up Youth crews, um, just from the simple act of walking from the Mercado La Paloma to the Expo Farm, they were they were stopped by police. A group of you know about how many was it at the time? About ten of our youth, two of them thrown into a police car because somebody had phoned up the police and given a description of someone you know, was a young black man. I mean, okay, you know, typical stuff, right? So even that kind of thing we've we've experienced. Our young people have experienced on numerous occasions. So there's lots of stories like that in terms of you know, how um, to create this sort of, um, this, this wall around USC and this kind of make USC safer, the impact that alone has on the, on the surrounding neighborhood, right? Um, you know, so there's that side of it. And then there's also the, the sort of, um, the really, and, and it's very violent in a way, you know, the, the displacement that happens of communities as gentrification happens, as um, the, you know, property value, values go up, um, as people are, you know, um, lose their homes, lose their businesses because of that. Um, and, and it's happening everywhere. And, you know, the only, I mean, uh, the only sort of real community kind of I've seen that's really kind of like come together and, and I'm seeing and it's really inspiring is in East LA. I think there's a there's a real vibrant kind of movement against that, right? That is interesting to see and follow um, in terms of really trying to trying to do something about that in an organized way. Now I don't know where that will go. But in terms of what we're doing here as a USC neighbor, there's a lot of and I don't want to be the merchant of doom and gloom because there's a lot of positive stuff and there's a lot of people in this room we work with that hopefully I'll be able to talk about in a minute. But you know um, our our response has been you know, what we can do is we can definitely highlight and talk about some of these issues, right? But we can also do something to create an alternative. And that's, that's what we've been engaged in doing, in building farms in our neighborhood, in building relationships for many, many years with farmers, 
in Southern California, buying from them directly, creating our own distribution network, creating our own food economy here in South LA, that's where we're selling really high quality, beyond organic, affordable food in our neighborhood, at venues that people can actually access and purchase this food from, and creating training and creating jobs. And, and ultimately, that's, that's our response as, as a group of people, as a community of people, is to say, we just have to kind of do our own. You know, because you can get the stores in, and the history has been, and I mentioned it before, stores come in, they take all the, the, the kind of, uh, you know, tax values they can get that they get, you know, um, and then they, they, they're open for a few years and they leave again. That, that's the history, that's the cycle, and don't believe me, look into it yourselves and find that out, right? So, we kind of have to do something, we have to do it for ourselves, um, and, and just build in our own community with as many alliances as we can build, as we are doing with folks here in this room, right? But really, we've got to build something from the neighborhood, from the community, that is built on local skills, local talent, local people, so therefore it's sustainable and it's going to last. JP, did you have? Well, you know, I'm not from this area, but I did grow up down the street from here on 42nd and Hoover, and I noticed that there is a lot of change in this area with a lot of security. Um, I remember that when I was growing up, we used to use USC as, a, as these little streets right here through the, through the university to get from, from where we used to kick it at all the way to 32nd uh, to the village so we could go to the movies and not get harassed by the gangs that were surrounding the, 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 the university. But now, I mean, 20, after coming back over here, you know, 20 years later, I noticed that there's more not only police, but a lot of public safety officers. You know, and I think it, it's, it's a good thing because, I mean, there used to be a lot of crime in the area, you know, so. Can okay. I, can I just? Sure, um, yeah, so after, um, then we'll open it up to yeah. Q&A. I but. mean, I wanna, I mean, I think we can use Lamar Park as a really interesting example. And, and, you know, one of the areas that our work has touched on, this idea of developing cultural districts. And, um, um, you know, there's a lot of, um, challenge in that too because often what happens is you have artists come in and you know make a place vibrant and then the artists end up getting kicked out because the property values go up and um, you know folks move in who can afford it which are generally not artists but Lamert Park and places like it provide an interesting example um, you know there was a big push to um, get a metro station in Lemur Park recently. And, and I've always been a little bit on the fence about that because with the coming metro station, of course, you know, there's um, opportunity for the people who own property, but then, you know, the, it's challenging because you get um, real estate speculation. And about the same time that the metro station was, um, got approved, you had several buildings in the village that were available. I don't know if it quite lined up, but there was a lot of property available. So it made me very nervous because it seemed like it was going to be um, an opportunity for folks to come in and, and take over this this place that, you know, when you talk about art and social justice, Lemur Park is a symbol of that um, in the history of Los Angeles. Um, but um, so as happens, in, in my mind, the best examples of these cultural districts, you have an enlightened developer who is thinking about the overall mission of the place and, and purchases a property and then creates a use of that property that is in line with that mission. So in this case, we have, um, as a, one of our benefactors in Lamert Park, Mark Bradford, who is a very, very successful artist. His painting sell for $1.8 million and, you know, in that range. So he has the wherewithal along with Eileen Norton, who used to be married to Peter Norton of the Norton uh, uh, antivirus program. So, you know, that's also a lot of money. So they have purchased, I don't know, how much has is, is it been? They own like... Yeah, right, and so on our side, they own all of this land. <laughs> and so they've created something called Art and Practice, which is a, you know, an amazing program that's a, both an artist and residency program and also a program to develop um, foster youth and um, 
uh, with galleries and other kinds of programming. And the Hammer Museum has come in and, and um, created a partnership. So it's, you know, creating all this amazing vibrancy in the neighborhood while also keeping true to the mission of uh, uh, Lemur Park. So, so what I feel like should happen in this community is that USC should take leadership and really think about what do we want this community to be? What do we want this community to look like? We don't want to push out uh, everybody. You, it would be, you know, what's the, what are the best communities? The best communities have everyone, you know, from those that are the neediest to, you know, everybody um, in between, or, or, you know, all the way up to those that have the most and everybody in between. And so I think you, USC could do that and then, you know, and then play the role of the enlightened developer, you know, thinking about the, the amount of money that is resident in this institution um, and partner with others to fulfill. I mean, how amazing would that be as an example of, of the, the partner that um, a university uh, and the role that a university might play, so. That's a good point. I mean, I, I think universities are thought of as just education institutions, but in this era, they're developers as well. So being a responsible developer can actually be a good message to send to USC as a university. But anyway, I, I do want to open this up to Q&A. So um, please, if, if uh, you have any questions, can you guys line up to the mics? And um, there's some ground rules real quick. Uh, we're going to keep you to one minute and uh, your Q&A. And please craft it as a question to the panelists. Uh, and to be, again, to be fair and respect everybody's time, I'm gonna keep you to a minute. So please start lining up if you have questions as well on this side as well, both bikes work. So um, uh, go ahead and state your name and maybe uh, your affiliation as well. Yeah, um, my name is Jose Aviles. I'm a community member and I kind of want to connect with all of you. I've been gone for six years and a lot of my life has been like doing urban organic farming in Minneapolis, being a dancer, being a cyclist in Minneapolis, and I just came back from working on a farm in Wisconsin. <laughs> But um, part of the reason that I left the neighborhood, I'm from South LA, was because of this fear of violence, um, especially as a queer femme of color. So my question is to all of you, and have you had any queer young people work in, in your organizations? And how do you handle, um, especially a lot of like femphobia and transphobia and homophobia, which is very also a, a big issue within communities of color in our neighborhood? Thank you. Yes, I do it I've, for about five years. I used to have um, um, several balls, uh, mini balls, uh, that guys come from one o'clock to five in the morning, and we did that for five years. Um, I also, and we did that with HIV, working with the whole HIV thing. Uh, and then uh, more recently, last year, we worked with the Outfest and we were, uh, we were um, helped in the sense of the screenings of their works. And, um, and we're going to do it again this year in April. We'll have uh, an Outfest uh, uh, screenings and such. So one of the things that I believe is that it takes the community and the community is everybody. So, um, and that's the only way for me to work. Anybody want to, before we go? Yeah, I mean, uh, I just, you know, I think it's, for me, it's very clear wherever you are, Jose, I've kind of lost you. But, oh, there you are. Okay, you know, um, I think that it's, a, it's an issue that we face he head on. We, we have had and we do have people in our team, um, you know, folks with, with all kinds, describe themselves in all kinds of ways, right? Um, define themselves in all kinds of ways. And that's just not within CSU, that's not a barrier to anything. Um, and and we, we face those issues head on, those issues do exist in our community, and there's just, on our part, there's no tolerance for them. You know, and, and I don't think that there can be if, if we're really kind of um, about transformative change and, you know, dealing with racism and sexism and whatever else, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's my, my simple response. Um, and then we also partner with and work with um, organizations and agencies who do that work, you know what I mean? Because we, we get it and we understand and, and we incorporate it into what we do, but it's not our primary work in terms of challenging, right? So we, we work with other folks who do that work on, on a more consistent, and, and it's their kind of mission to do that. Um, in, you know, and, and then we partner with them as and when we feel the need to. 
Do you want to name a couple of those organizations that might that work in the area? So, so one of the folks that, that I know personally and, and we've worked with is Peer Health Exchange. So if you know, you know, you know, you know those folks, but we work with them and have done trainings with them in the past and will again in the future. Okay. So Go ahead. Right, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Darren Oliver. Um, I'm a graduate student here as well as uh, you know, born and raised in South LA. Um, but one of the things that uh, was funny when I left uh, for undergraduate, uh, my undergraduate education uh, in New York is that you know, I'd be talking to my friends and you know, it, it'd be late at night and I'd get hungry and I, I'd say, you know, oh, I, I want to go to the liquor store to get some chips. And they would be like, what are you talking about, liquor store? You know, like, you know, because out there, the liquor store is only sells liquor. And out here, you know, the liquor store, it, it's a liquor bank. <laughs> you can get your check cash there. You can also, uh, <laughs> you can do a variety of things at the liquor store, including it being the primary place where you get produce. Whether or not it, and for me still, you know, now that I moved back to South LA, it still is the place because it's walkable. You know, I'm not going to walk, you know, three or four you know, miles down the street or even a mile down the street to go get a, a loaf of bread when I could just walk around the corner and there is a liquor store that should have uh, a, a nice loaf of bread and maybe some lettuce and tomatoes that are fresh and stuff like that. But it, it, it's something that I, I constantly find that is not there, especially when there's liquor stores three on a corner, three across the street, and they say that they're a market, but you know, they don't, they don't have the food except for the cold beer and exquisite wine that they have that's in a can. Uh, <laughs> and, and I just wanted to, to, to just to say about, you know, what, what could be done in order to foster whether or not it's, it's small business owners to begin marketing fresher produce or just to begin, you know, you could sell a, a can of OD, but if you could sell some orange juice too, that would be great. Uh, you know, that, that's really that's a perfect you know, question, question for yeah. actually what's being done. We work with, we currently work with corner stores in South LA to do this. So um, I, I'm not sure exactly where, where you are. Where are you in South LA? Where are you based? Um, I'm, I'm more on the east side, kind of um, east, east of uh, the 110 freeway around off of Broadway. Um, okay, okay, gotcha. So you're a little bit, little bit further out. So we work with, um, we work with um, two stores right now, Mama's Chicken. Um, which some of you, you folks know, and we source um, fresh produce for her store. And then we also work with um, Century, Liquor, Century Market, it used to be called Century Liquor, it's now called Century Market because of some of the work that we've been doing. And so we started out with um, Century Market doing a weekly produce stand um, out, outside the market in the parking lot. And then very recently, and Chris can remind me, but our youth teams did a lot of work and we, we launched... Um, sales of produce, fresh produce in the market. When was that? When, we, when did we launch that? In the fall? I don't, but, but recently, we had a big launch, and so now that market also sells produce on a daily basis. Um, and we've worked with a, two or three other stores in South LA that aren't yet consistent. But you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's, that's some of the stuff that we need to do and that we are working on. And, and you know, our, our thing is, it's not about, you don't have to bring in a huge market. You have to work with what's already there. And that's, that's kind of what our thing has been, is to like really bring the food to where the people are already at, right? So we bring our produce stands to where parents already come, young people already come, and we bring produce to those markets that are already being, um, you know, frequented in the neighborhood. You also have a healthy food South LA map you might oh, want to talk about. Oh, yeah. Well, I actually wanted to mention there are a number of people in this room who we work with. Francois, um, Carolina, I don't know where Carolina is. There she is back there um, with the USC Neighborhood Outreach Program. Um, and then we have um, Diane is here somewhere. We work with, um, with Diane and, um, you know, Garrett who, um, Garrett, who used to be a USC student. There's a, num there's a number of people here. And, you know, I'll say that USC hasn't had, doesn't have and hasn't had, for good reasons, the best reputation for doing this community work, right? But there are shining examples of where it is happening. And I've named some of those, and we're doing some amazing projects. So one of the things that we've done is partnering with Francois and, and other folks who work with Francois and other folks in the community to create a healthy food map in South LA that you can actually get. We can send you to the website. We have flyers of it that point out some of these places you can go to and you can buy fresh produce. Mama's Chicken is on there. 
I'm not sure if I think Century Market's just been added onto the new version of the map, but there's a number of other outlets there. So you can get that map and you know, you can bike there or walk there. We have the route. Um, so yeah, so that so you know there's some there's some really amazing projects that are happening and are happening in partnership with forward-thinking people on the campus. And we're really happy to say that we're part of every one of those. And I want to second that because I'm I've been quite um, amazed at um, the level of, communi of community involvement that USC actually has and the resources that they invest in actually, you know, trying to connect with the community that surrounds the campus, so. Yeah, I just uh, had to uh, mention that Diane and David are about to build a aquaponic system that is going to be built at our farm and left at our farm. I just had to really give a shout out. Oh, and, and yeah, and, um, we have a farmer's market also uh, that, uh, that's a part of our Seeds of Carver. Um, uh, Maria Lise is running that every Saturday. Uh, it's something that we're wanting it to migrate into Lamert Park too, so it could be a other part of the plaza. Um, so that's healthy food. And then there's another organization that's pushing real strongly toward that that's called SOLA, who's South L LA Health organization that's trying to do more with getting fresh food into the liquor stores. Okay. Yeah, hi everybody. Thanks very much to the organizers and the participants. I'm really enjoying this. Thanks to all the work you do out there every day. Uh, my name is Pierrette Hondinu Sotelo. I'm a sociologist here at USC, and I'm also part of the Center for the Study of Immigrant Integration with a group of students and colleagues. We're actually doing the study in South LA, trying to understand the Latino story in a way, and tell it in a way that's not nationalistic and kind of looking at these bridges, alliances, shared projects, and spaces. But I have a very specific question for all of you. And that has to do with the topic of recreation and public spaces, public parks, public community gardens. Um, you probably all know, but maybe everybody here doesn't know that LA is supposedly the most park poor big city in the United States for many reasons. South LA is probably the most park poor area of all of LA. So I'd like to ask you what, what um, do you think is the potential in public green spaces in South LA for not only recreation, but recreation, the transcendental, the transformative, the build, bridging build, uh, bridge building that can occur between black and brown communities. Well, let's see, I, I, I kind of, in our area, we have a lot of phenomenal parks. The pro problem is, is how they're engaged um, because we have the Dorsey one, we have um, a real beautiful one at Jim Gilliam, and then there's the Kenneth Hahn Park that's, that you can go fishing in and you can walk and run in. Uh, the, the real problem has been the fear factor. Uh, and um, so for about five years, I worked with uh, Summer Night Lights where we focused um, at that time period from 5 o'clock until 12 a, uh, p.m. at night, or a.m. at night, right? And uh, part of the process, uh, I mean, and it made the parks very safe. So I think basically what happens with the parks is that they're not engaging the kids correctly by providing the, the real uh, things that they're interested in, you know? Um, and once we were able to do that, all the fear factor disappeared because uh, idle minds weren't able to do idly crazy things, you know? So, um, and as a matter of fact, <clears throat> in Jim Gilliam itself, we were able to bring down the crime to zero, you know, to, because the kids were engaged, having fun and dancing parties and food and stuff. Now, all the things that other parks have in the west side, that, those things are missing within uh, the parks that are in our neighborhood. So I think that that's really the problem. I think they're improperly engaged by the county. I mean, you know, we haven't built any parks, but we've built six urban farms in South LA, two of which we maintain. Um, and, you, you know, if you come out on the second Saturday of any month um, from nine till one, you'll see intergenerational, like from grandmothers to little kids, 
um, at our Garden Gateway workshops, a program supported by Carolina's um, program. And, you know, folks out learning how to farm, learning how to cook with the food they grow, working with our youth, learning how to do that. This past one we had, you know, training people how to build raised beds, giving them the, the resources to go home and build their own raised bed. And these are black and brown families working together to do this stuff in green spaces, you know, um, beautiful spaces. I think they are. They're not parks, but they're, they're gorgeous spaces. Um, you know, so I think for, for us, it's really just been about, um, and some of these spaces we cre we've created are, actually they're, well, no, three of them were on, in private homes. Three of them are on public land, in schools and on city-owned land. You know, and, and it's been a very conscious strategy on our part to, to sort of like something that would have been concrete to actually create green space on it, to create food landscaping, to, to just turn it into something beautiful. You should come out and see the, um, the fruit tree orchard at Normandy Avenue. You know, it's a, it's a gorgeous space. Um, that the, the students at Normandy come and they sit under those trees. It's, they call it, they have a sign up now, and they call it their reading grove. You know, those are the kinds of things that I think we have to do everywhere that we can. We have to turn it green, you know, and, and you can do that. It doesn't have to be a big space. You can do that with a small space. You can, you can make something really beautiful. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, I, I mean, I feel like a lot of these issues really do have to do with... Um, uh, enfranchising people, you know, really um, giving uh, or sup uh, what we do is really give people voice, you know, <laughs> it, um, show them that they actually have a voice uh, because so often I feel like people in South LA in particular um, do not feel like they have agency over what happens to them. And so, you know, in, in my neighborhood, I live in Mid-City, so, um, you know, if we see a vacant lot and it looks um, dangerous and ugly, you know, somebody on my street is going to call and say, you know, we need to deal with this problem. But, you know, when you feel like you're, you don't have that power, then you're, you're not going to do that. And there are lots of vacant lots that could be the parks that you're talking about if um, people felt um, empowered to. And there are, I know there's a program called Free Lots Los Angeles. So there are programs that are focused on transforming these lots into um, public spaces. Um, so, you know, it, those kinds of partnerships with communities, I think, can do a lot in terms of um, creating um, the opportunity for public space. Now, I mean, the other issue that we've touched upon in this conversation is the, the challenge with, um, you know, feeling safe. Um, and um, such a, lot of neighbor, a lot of areas that we've gone in, that's a big issue for people. And so, you know, using public space is um, really dependent on how safe you feel in the public realm. And we've heard, um, you know, just um, the young people that we work with often, you know, we were working at Fremont at one point, and, you know, when I just remember hearing stories of kids having to walk, you know, many blocks out of their way to avoid being in the wrong place. Um, and so, you know, that's another issue that has to be dealt with if we're gonna, you know, create um, these, this community where there's public spaces throughout and people are comfortable coming together in those spaces. Can, can I just really quickly say on that, like Martin Luther King Park, any of you know about King Park? It was, it, I mean, when my kids were little and I would take them there to go on the swings and stuff, people told me I was crazy. You know, it, it was not a park that people frequented, they went to with their kids and stuff. Um, I mean, I, I went anyway, because that's just how I am. But that park and the neighborhood around it has been transformed 
you know, by the work that Community Coalition has done and that we have then partnered with them to do with the market that I mentioned earlier, right? So I just say that to say that it is, it is possible to do this, and that's a park that people didn't go to for the reasons that you're talking about. Prostitution, not feeling safe, you know, not wanting to take their kids there, want, not wanting their kids to be out there after a certain time of the evening, and that whole area has now been completely transformed. There's all kinds of programming taking place there. So I do think that, I just want to say that it is very possible, and I know you know this, but it's just about people coming together and deciding where we're going to do this and, exactly. and just making it happen, you know? Exactly. And I just want to add one more thing. I mean, so often when we're doing our projects and, um, you know, the young people start and they're, um, you know, gathering stories about their neighborhood and they're always shocked at how amazing their neighborhoods are. So, so you know, part of it is just feeling good about the physical environment and, and, and the place in which you live. I, I so believe that place, your, the place that you live in is, is integrally tied to your sense of identity. And so the better you feel about the place, the better you feel about yourself and the more empowered you are. And so, so you know, I feel like that's part of the equation. And I want to move to one last question with Sarah, but before mentioning that, uh, the Free Locks Los Angeles, L-O-T-S, so it's a coalition of Esperanza Housing Corporation, Trust South LA, working on uh, reimagining vacant lots. Also, there's the Trust for Public Land working on the um, Green Alleys initiative of trying to turn alleys in South LA into green areas. And also, in terms of the safety, it's a big issue. Uh, summer nights light, uh, night lights from the city and the gang uh, youth and reduction unit, they actually sponsor um, summer programs for, for safety because it is the physical place, but really a lot of it is also like um, the panelists are saying, the safety and, the, and really the connections and so forth. So kind of want to take that question from Sarah. Okay. All right, I'll kind of build on what was um, sort of get with the conversation you guys were having before. My name is Sarah and I write for Streets Blog. I cover South LA and Boyle Heights, and I know all of these, I'm privileged to know all these folks, and the reason that I love them so much bec is because the, p the power of the work that they do, and I think one of the things that people, I mean, a lot of us have like the real do-good spirit, like, oh, I wanna go into the South LA, and I wanna help South LA, I wanna do something for South LA, but I think what's really instructive about what these folks do is, is the work is, hi, William, is really, um, it, it's, it's beyond um, just a single issue. So Neelam doesn't just do food. The justice element is driving, as she talked about early, earlier on in the presentation, is, is, is justice is, is linked, it, it's throughout. Um, there's no separation between those two things. Um, and with JP, for example, it's, it, he doesn't just take kids on bike rides. Like the amount of mentoring and everything else that goes on to keep that club going is, is what makes it so successful. It's not just, oh, let's go for a bike ride. They don't have the luxury of, of just doing that because of all of the issues that are in South LA, all the challenges that are there. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, because I do want to make JP talk. <laughs> um, because, because, well, because of, I know him so well and I know how special the work that he's done, how powerful it has been. Um, but if all of you could talk a little bit about the challenges of, of, of incorporating all those other issues, like the things that kids come to um, all the, the challenges at home, everything that, that is part of the work that you're doing that's not just, obviously the, the, the programs that you have help them work through those different things, if that makes sense. Okay, um, I think that, that our biggest challenge right now is that because we're not a nonprofit organization, um, there is no funding, so everything comes out of my pocket. That's the only thing that is kind of like slowing us down now. A lot of these kids, yeah, you know what, they want to go, they want to go out on trips and, and, and I'm very limited to that because I could only do so much, you know, so there is more than just, like Sarah said, there's, there's more than just the cycling, you know, these kids come and they see me at least three times a week and, 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 and if it's not for one thing, it's another, sometimes they're having a problem or they just need somebody to talk to. And they know where to find me, even, even on my days off. You know, they know they could get a hold of me and they know that I'll meet them somewhere so we could talk. So I mean, they know that my doors are always open 24 seven. I mean, I really don't know what more can I say about that. You know, just that 
about the parks thing. I did have plans on doing things at our local park, but the only thing that holds me back is that I don't have the connections to get around all these permits that they're asking me for. You know, they want to get paid. They want me to pay so much money for a permit. Um, I was planning on bringing an adult softball league there, but the park won't help me because they want me to get the, the adequate permits. Nobody uses the, 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 the brand new field that the Dodgers sponsored at Ted Watkins only on the weekends. The, the baseball team uses it, and during the week, no one is allowed to step inside of that area. They lock it up. We can't use it. You know, they ask for permits. You know, I mean, I have, a lot, I have a lot of adults that are anxious to come out to South LA and play, you know? And we can't do that because these people, I mean, I walk in there and automatically they think that, you know what, oh, well, this guy's, you know, gang related or, or why should we, you know, let him do this? Maybe they're just gonna destroy the, the you know, the, the field or whatever, but. What we want to do in South LA, if we're able to, to get the parks to cooperate with me or with, or with the other bike club, um, we could bring these people and, and, and people start to notice that there really is something going on at that park and people will start to come out, not only, not only during the summer. So you want to do things there besides, yeah, because I mean, parks after dark, they're there during the summer and it's safer and yeah, there's a lot of police activity going on. But, this past summer, even though there was a lot of police activity, there was a shooting, and the sheriffs were right there when it happened. But because it happened on city property, the sheriffs really didn't do anything. Right. You see? So, as a matter of fact, I heard stories that, that one of the sheriffs was trying to push the kid into the street so he wouldn't be on the, on the county side. And that way the LAPD could take care of the situation. So, I mean, we have to deal with stuff like that. And what I'm trying to do, I mean, I'm trying to bring more than cycling to the community. I want to get a lot of these, a lot of these kids engaged and, 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 and getting them involved with, with, with the rest of the community and playing together and doing some kind of, a, you know, some kind of recreational activity, but I can't do that if I don't have the money. And of course, you know, for example, I mean, Kaiser was willing to donate $500 to me, but because I don't have a nonprofit status, they can't write that off, and they can't give me the money because they just don't want to give it to me, so they want to use it as a tax write-off, and that's where people turn their backs on me. Nonprofit industrial complex. But I'll just say, I mean, I'm really happy, Sarah, that you got JP to talk. So first of all, you know, CSU's history, part of it is that um, our former ED, who's also an attorney, he has a history in community economic development. And for a long time, CSU existed to really help and, and to facilitate community organizations getting their nonprofit status. So I just want to say to you that if that's something you want to do, you want, and even if you don't want to get your own nonprofit status, we currently sponsor with our nonprofit status several grassroots agencies like yourselves, and we offer that. So I just want to, you know, put that out there. We can talk if that's something that you're interested in. Definitely want to talk about that and make that happen. Um, but in terms of your, your question, Sarah, I mean, you know, it's, it's something that we talk about all the time, that the work that we do in South LA, I mean, you know, the, the, we go to conferences, right? Like, you know, around food, right? You know, food people having food conferences that I find really exhausting most of the time. Um, and you get lots of people in a room and everyone's kind of, you know, talking about, and something that I've, I've, I'm not, I've tried to really kind of like have a conversation about is the work that you're doing around these issues in the valley or in, you know, wherever it might be, it's, it's just not the same as what we do. Yes, on the surface, you might be building a garden in a school or you might be, you know, something on the surface looks like it's the same or similar, but the issues are just so different. I mean, the, the neglection of a neighborhood like South LA, the, the oppression that exists, and that's really what it is, and people call it all kinds of other stuff, you know, but that's what it is. I mean, you know, and, and I can just highlight it by like, I, I recently, four years ago, I moved to downtown, um, and just the experience of going to a bank or going to a post office, can I tell you, it's, it is such an incredibly different experience to do something like that in downtown LA than it is to do it in South LA. Just in terms of the under-resourcing, the, the, you know, just the, 
the way that we just we just don't have infrastructure in South LA, right? Things, everything that you do, whether it be going to get public transport, whether it be going to do, you know, personal business, everything just has so much more drama and and um, stress involved in it. And uh, and you you know, and I, I tried to explain this to somebody at a conference once, and and I realized it's like actually we just probably live on different planets, even though we're kind of here together. I'm sure you're not really not on the same plane as me because you clearly don't understand what I'm talking about. And, you know, for, for to be growing up in South LA, I didn't grow up here, but my, my children grew up here. And I can tell you that it's, it's, a, it's, you know, when I came here, you know, I was a young parent and I was, and I've told this story before that, you know, my mother, when I was getting on the plane with my kids to move to South LA, she's like, you're going to kill my grandchildren. I mean, she was, you know, she was kind of very dramatic about it because she'd seen boys in the hood, right? So that was her only kind of, um, no, I mean, that was her only connection, right? But, and, 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 you know, I was like, mother, don't be ridiculous. It's not, and, and it's not, it wasn't like that, you know, but there is, there is a level of just daily oppression and, and just, you know, our schools are overcrowded and underfunded. Our, just everything about our infrastructure is, has been, and for a long time. So what we always say is the issues that we're dealing with have been created over many, many years and they're systemic. And the only way we're going to deal with them is with a long-term commitment and a systemic approach. And really, the people who are paying the brunt of that are our young people. Let's be very absolutely real about that, right? Like, you know, we know all the statistics about the, the, the education system. Our, our kids are leaving high school with a fifth to seventh grade reading level, right, in South LA. That's not me making that up. That's, that's fact. <laughs> Right? Um, you know, in terms of the opportunities for, I mean, all oh, go on and on and on. And then the health disparities, like coming back to food and what's available. It's, and, and it expresses itself, it shows itself. It shows itself in the work that we do. And it makes what we do, you know, much, much harder, but in, uh, for the same reasons, and these things are always flip sides of the coin, right? Also, much, much more rewarding, ultimately. Uh, and, you know, that's, what I can say about that. Yeah, and one of the things that we constantly forget is uh, this oppression is due to almost how many years of, of a depression that this country is in? You know, I, I think in all the, the depression is really deep and strong and hard is in, in our neighborhoods. The other thing um, that tended to happen is the summer night lights program and the infrastructural parts of it got taken over by the grid. You know, so they made everybody all gang, it, it, like gang instead of art. And as soon as they made it gang oriented, then that's why you start having shootings. Uh, and then it also means more jobs for the sheriffs and police. Um, and it seemed very much uh, the whole five years that I was there, it was a tuck and pull with that whole idea. And the first year they got a group of artists, master artists to start the project. And then each year they started taking them out and made it uh, slowly into a police program again. And so I think that those are the things that we really have to uh, deal with. Uh, it's a constant fight, but it's really hard to deal with it because even the infrastructure of how the city looks at artists made it not work also because they see the artists as really kind of like uh, children. Um, so, you know, I, I think fundamentally, I believe that change comes when the people who are, you know, sort of suffering um, are decide that they want change. Really, I mean, I think that's how it happens. I mean, I, I I'm, I'm sure you, many of you have seen the movie Selma, which is so moving, and and uh, my husband and I went to um, Selma many years ago and the most moving thing, we went, we did a south tour and the most moving thing was the, that we saw was a monument at the Southern Poverty Law Center that was by Maya Lin who did the Veterans Memorial in Washington and it was a memorial to all the people who died um, as part of that movement. All the people whose names you've never heard of that died to make that change. And, um, you know, I said it before, so much of that is about people getting really, feeling like they have the power, they have the voice to step up. And I feel like 
that's what the arts, that's what participation in the arts does, is it enables you to be the creative being that we all are and to see that you can create your reality, basically. Yeah. And so, um, so when we, like we are part of the Building Healthy Communities Collaborative, one of the only arts organization that's part of that in response to what Syra was asking. And what we're bringing to that context is this opportunity for people to actually, um, people, not organizations, you know, that's the challenge. Um, um, so people to talk about what they want to see in terms of South LA as a healthy place and feeling like then they can move towards being advocates for their own, for creating the reality that they want. Um, and so um, when you talk about art as social justice, I think that's a big part of it. I mean, the other part is, um, you know, I don't know if you all feel this, but I feel like we're losing touch with our humanity. And so, um, you know, that's another role that, or another opportunity that the arts provides for all of us, not just people who are struggling in South LA, to stay connected with us. Because as technology becomes more and more a part of our lives, we, we lose that connection to ourselves. And, and it is that person-to-person -person connection that we're trying to cultivate in our work that really enables us to um, solve problems together and, and move forward. So, so I feel like if we're gonna, if the issues in South LA are gonna get solved, they're really about, you know, again, building those connections between people to solve them. Yep. I actually want to end this now, and actually, we're gonna continue the discussion actually up in the second floor patio. So the panelists will be there, but I wanna thank the panelists again and um, continue the discussion up after the second floor.